une conférence régionale sur la théorie de l'île. Uh, we'll begin by Alex Weeks, and he will talk about Coulomb branches and Yang Yans. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm disappointed that we're not all together in person, but uh, it's very nice to be here, and thank you for listening. I'm very grateful to, to Michael and Erhard and the CRM for uh, persevering to put this conference on. It's, it's really wonderful. So, I must also apologize in advance. I live right beside the hospital here in Vancouver, and uh, sometimes the helicopters come in. And so it's possible to be a very loud noise at some point, but hopefully not, fingers crossed. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about Kumo branches and Yang Yins. Uh, here's a little introduction. So I, I'm gonna talk about this from a very algebraic point of view, I would say, uh, or try to focus on the algebraic side. So I'm interested in two non-commutative algebras that are, everything's over complex numbers um, coming from mathematical physics. And it's this diagram here. There's a surjection from a shifted Yang Yin one algebra to another algebra called the quantized Coulomb branch. Um, so in this talk, uh, first is, what, well, what, what on earth all these algebras exactly? I tried to sketch this. Um, second, I'll talk about some examples um, and some properties. And three, some representation theory. And I would say that for the most part, the latter half of the talk is gonna be focused on why this Coulomb branch sort of uh, even thought of as just a black box is a, is a really interesting thing to study because well, first of all, it realizes some very interesting and familiar algebras, like um, the enveloping algebra of GLN, for example. And second is that it gives us some new techniques for studying the representation theory, even of those familiar algebras. So uh, that's the plan. So as I said, I'll, I'll start with uh, what are these algebras? So let's just get to it. Um, I thought I would actually just give a quick overview of what is a shifted Yang in, since it's maybe the most algebraic part of this talk. And um, it's not so important the exact definition, but I thought I will give it. So. Um, let's just fix some notation. We'll take a, a simple Lie algebra G, some Chevrolet generators for that. So E I H I F I. Um, then <clears throat> what we can do is choose a coweight for G. I'll call it mu. And um, simply put, that's going to be an integer for every node of the Dinkin diagram. And, and a little more explicitly, I, what I mean there is I'm going to write it in the basis of fundamental coweights. Um, so it's an integral coweight. Then <clears throat> there's an associated algebra, y mu, um, which depends on g and this coweight called the shifted Yangian. And it's actually defined by some explicit generators and relations. Um, more on that in a second. But two things to say. One is that this is inspired by and generalizes the shifted Yangians of, of Brunden and Klushchev. Um, I put a little asterisk on generalizes because I'm technically dealing with simple Lie algebras, not GLN, so it would be SLN, but this is kind of a minor distinction which we can just sweep under the rug. Um, so that's one thing to think. This is basically coming from the ideas of Brunning and Kleshev, but very generalized. And, and second is that if there's no shift, if the shift is zero, we're just talking about the ordinary Yangian as defined by Brinfeld. So something familiar uh, to probably some of you. Um, so let's just discuss the SL2 case and uh, not write any more relations. So just to flash them here. So. SL2 has a basis E, H, and F, the usual guys. Uh, our coweight here is just one integer, mu. So it's an integer. Then <clears throat> this shifted Yangian has sort of three generators with they, they have this upper index R um, and they're E, F, and H. And somehow E and F, they only raise over the non-negative integers, but H ranges over all of the integers, this S. And here are the relations. <laughs> it's a little be bewildering looking. Um, I just wanted to write them down once, but there's some something saying that the H's are like the Cartan, they commute. There's some relation telling you that E and F act bracket to H like you expect, but then there's this big mess down at the bottom. Um, and if this were some other simple Lie algebra, there would also be Serre relations, but since it's SL2, we can ignore that. Um, but here they are. So you don't need to know this. I just want to say it is something explicit you can write down. <laughs> so in spite of that complexity, there's actually fairly good understanding of these algebras. For example, there's some filtration, at least on the unshifted, usually Yangian, where you get the enveloping algebra, the current algebra. So um, Yevgeny Fagan's talk yesterday was focused on current algebras. Here's a, another appearance of them as an associated graded. And um, it's very explicit. So, you know, here I had E, H, and F. I have my SL2, E, H, and F, and they exactly correspond by just sort of, well, there's a little shift, but basically the R is the loop variable. 
Um, uh, and this is reflected in the representation theory, connections with file modules, and so on. Mm. Uh, in general, though, it's just there's a sort of PPW theorem that this, all of these shifted Jungians actually look like the current algebra. This is not true as algebras, and it, it's not even true for as sort of filtered associated graded, um, but you can think of it as a vector space. This is what it looks like. In fact, what is true, though, is that um, this shifted Jungian has another filtration where it looks like functions on the space. So the associated graded is functions on some, it's actually some sort of infinite type affine scheme, but it's something associated to the loop group. Um, so that's what it is. So that's one algebra. The second thing in the beginning of the talk is the uh, Coulomb branches. So what are they? Um, and th this is a, a very fastly growing area, but, and this is a very rough summary, but, um, Here's some idea of what this is. So this, <clears throat> the Coulomb branch itself, or Coulomb branches, are, are some sort of spaces coming from quantum field theory. Uh, and specifically, you could say they're coming from this 3D n equals 4 supersymmetric gauge theory. So I, I don't really know what that is, but it comes from physics. And physicists would say that the Coulomb branch is some sort of hyperkähler manifold, or maybe a singular hyperkähler manifold. The difficulty was that it's very difficult to write down what that means. And it's, it's only very recently that there has been some progress actually by Brockman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima. They've given a sort of rigorous mathematical definition, but um, only as an algebraic variety over the complex numbers. So you could say that's a, either a losing some information because you're forgetting the hyperkähler structure, or for, for the purposes of this talk, this is a very good thing. <laughs> we only care about over C. So here's some nice algebraic variety coming from physics. And, but one, one of the, for the purpose of this talk, what's even more important is that their, their construction naturally produces some non-commutative algebras, uh, which you could call the kind of quantized Coulomb branch. So I'm gonna call this script A. And <clears throat> they have the property that uh, there's some filtration where the associated graded is, is the coordinate ring of the Coulomb branch. So this is an example of a deformation quantization. So they have some general procedure, which I'll sort of briefly outline in a moment, which just spits out these uh, interesting spaces and interesting non-commutative algebras. Um, and it's kind of an involved construction, but so just a hint as to why this might be interesting. Well, here's some simple examples. So the simplest example actually is just a ring of difference operators. So this is an example of the non-commutative algebra. So it has, uh, it's basically the difference operators in um, a single variable W. And so this beta is a shift of W by, by one and beta inverse the opposite, where if you prefer, and so those are the only relations in the ring. You could also say that this is the differential operators on C star because we have this element beta and beta inverse. So that's like coordinate ring of C star. And you can think of W as being this kind of um, negative uh, degree operator essentially. So what this also tells you is that the Coulomb branch in this case is the, the, the um, cotangent bundle of C star. So it's an affine variety. It has a nice symplectic structure actually here, and this is some quantization. So that's the simplest example of a Coulomb branch. Um, maybe one step beyond that would be something like the Kleinian singularity, where that comes up as a Coulomb branch too. Um, oh, okay, well, those mo it was meant to come up to one at a time, but that's okay. So some more other interesting examples are, are the enveloping algebra of GLN or finite W algebras of type A. So those are quantizing solidly slices or maybe we should add the word nilpotent cone in here somewhere, but you can pretend the Coulomb branch is GLN. So these are some examples of what a Coulomb branch is. And before I get to the construction, I just want to mention some other just general facts is this Coulomb branch always contains the polynomial ring. It's a nice fact about them. So in the case of this difference operators, it's the functions in W. It's like, in terms of the cotangent bundle, it's functions on the, the fiber somehow. Um, and they have very nice algebraic properties, this Coulomb branch. So here's the theorem of BFN. So it's some finitely, this, whatever their construction is, it spits out some finitely generated Noetherian domains. They always have this, this polynomial ring, which is a maximal commutative subalgebra and they're free over it as a module. So as a left and as a right module. And another property is that the fraction field is a vial algebra. Uh, so 
These are some sort of very nice rings. They're, they kind of look like vinyl algebras, but they're a little more, more complicated than that. Um, maybe I need to wear it at some sort of finite group invariance here or something, but it doesn't really matter. So that's the summary. Uh, we'll come back to some examples in a sec, but uh, here's a, <laughs> a lightning explanation of this BFN construction, just so uh, you have some idea of, oh, pardon me? Does one know the rank of, uh, of over gamma? The, uh, of this file? Three over gamma. Oh, oh, sorry, of um, infinite rank, infinite rank. Uh, just as an example, in this difference operators case, um, it's a free module, I don't have my pen. It's a free module um, where the, the basis is the powers of this element beta, but otherwise it's sort of, so it's like a direct sum of infinitely many copies of polynomials. Yeah, it's always yeah. infinite time. Um, yeah, great question. And, and similarly, we can say stuff like, what is the rank of this file algebra and many other properties. Um, uh, so they can say a lot, it's quite, quite explicit, but at the same time, as we're about to see, um, kind of an esoteric definition, a little complicated. And uh, there's this trade-off here between having a complicated definition and having nice sort of tricks and tools to prove things about it. Um, here, the, there seem to be a lot of powerful techniques using Coulomb branches. Um, I'll get some examples throughout the talk. Um, so their construction, again, this is maybe too much information, but <laughs> I feel like I should at least say what it is if I said what Yangians are. So what does it depend on? It actually depends on some data, which is a pair of G and V. And G is some reductive group. Uh, and V is some representation of that group. So that's all you need, uh, finite dimensional. I, I've used the blackboard bold just so that we don't mix up G with, there was a Lie algebra at the beginning of this talk. It's not the same, uh, but they may not have no real relation. Um, Okay, so then this algebra is somehow associated to this data. It's, so it's A of, you could think of it as depending on G and V and <laughs> here's the, the, the complicated part of some Bora Moore homology ring. Um, and, and I've written it in the most succinct way. So this probably looks very mysterious. The space you take the homology of is actually some sort of stack. <laughs> and it's like maps from, well, there's a lot to parse here. Um, Again, this is meant to illustrate how complicated the definition kind of is, but so on the right, we have the stack quotient of V by G. And on the left, we're taking maps from, you take a formal disk and you take two copies of it and you glue them together away from the origin. So it's sort of like a, yeah, this formal disk with a fattened origin. Um, people like to call it a raviolo curve because if you think of one formal disk and another, sort of, there's like this bubble where you've glued them at the origin. It sort of kind of looks like a ravioli. Uh, <laughs> so you take maps from that to that. So here's the definition. Um, and, but <clears throat> one nice property is because it's some, some just formal property about Boromor homology, this, this will automatically contain the equivariant cohomological point, for example. Um, and that's this polynomial ring. And what Barberman, Finkelberg and Nakajima show is that this, this funny definition actually carries a sort of convolution product. So there's some multiplication structure making an associative algebra. So that's the idea. Um, yeah, and there, there are, this is not quite how, if you look at their paper, which I highly recommend, um, this is not quite how they write it down. They use a, a different version of kind of the same, some reinterpretation of this, which, which actually makes more sense, um, but it takes a little bit more to write down. So I'm gonna skip it for now. So anyway, it's a somewhat involved. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, so is it true that this Z is a, can be seen as a subspace inside affine Grassmannians times a V of Z? Is it the same construction? Yeah, you, you can think of it this that way. It, you can rewrite it as some something like that. Yeah, um, something more con a little bit more concrete even than this. So this this space here is related to. Um, so because it's maps into a, a stack quotient, it, this means that really we're looking at some sort of space of G bundles on, on the formal disk. And you should think that maybe that's related to the FN Gasmanian. And in fact, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, in fact, the passing from one disk to the other is what's going to 
encode the afrin Gasmanian element. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so this is just a, another way of rewriting this, what you may have seen already here. Thank you. So, but the, to summarize, it somehow depends on this input data, but the output is this nice finite type commutative ring. <laughs> okay. So um, the case I'm actually most interested in um, is something called the quiver gauge theory. And, and this is where we don't just put some random reductive group in representation. We're actually going to start with a quiver and we're going to see that we get something, some very nice algebras out of it. So let's begin with say a Dinkin diagram, although it actually works for any graph. So here's if my, let's, uh, this isn't my favorite Dinkin diagram, but it's, it's close to the top. Here's uh, A4. So what we're going to do is <clears throat> turn this into a quiver with framing. So we kind of add some framing nodes. Oh, well, there's a picture in a second. We choose an orientation, we choose some dimensions. So here's the picture. Um, you'll see at the bottom is the original Dinkin diagram. Uh, at the top are my framing nodes. So there's one for every vertex and it's only connected to its own vertex. And I've chosen some orientation that actually doesn't matter. And then I chose some dimensions. So I could pick any uh, non-negative integer at every node. This is the data we want. So to this data, <clears throat> you can associate some, some group and some representation and they're, they're sort of the obvious ones coming from this. Well, one is, the group is going to be the product of GLNs corresponding to the circled nodes. So you'll notice I've, I've drawn the framing as a box versus a circle. So I only care about the circles when it comes to this group. So here I would have GL of five times GL two times GL seven times GL seven. This is my group G. And the representation is just a HOM space for every arrow. So here we would have HOM from C to C five and we have HOM C two to C five. So this group, of course, naturally acts on that representation. And, and this is the pair that we want to look at. So this may look very familiar for people who have seen Nakajima quiver varieties before. This is exactly the same sort of data. <laughs> Not surprising, um, actually, because they are somehow related. Uh, so, okay, a little bit more notation. So I want to take this data and actually turn it into something Lee theoretic. So, okay, we've fixed the Dinkin diagram. So here we have say SL5, so there's some G corresponding to that. So SL5, say, but actually, actually you can allow simply laced Katsumuri Lie algebras. In fact, you can allow any quiver. So you can sort of, you can imagine some sort of generalization of that where you have loops or you have multiple edges and stuff. Um, Sorry, your, uh, your mic has a problem. Oh, okay. How is it now? Still? Still quiet. No, it's oh. good. Okay, should I continue or try to solve this? Back. It's back? Okay. Sorry about that. No. Mm. It's still quiet, Alex. Okay, should I, if I shout, is it better or is it, uh, should I try to switch out some, some microphone? Is it easy? I can switch to my other headphones. I just don't know if it will resolve the, the yeah, problem. Yeah, I don't know if that will help either. Um, the beginning of the talk, it was really nice. It was really good, good to hear. If you can come back to that setting. Yeah, I don't think I've changed anything, so. Um, I'm not sure, that's a good question. I think that we decided that my other microphone was worse than the current situation, so. Okay. I don't know, I don't see any change in my setting, so I'm not sure what would have changed, actually. Um, is it still having problems? I, we can hear you, it's just a, a bit quiet. So hopefully people have a volume control on their own computers at home and can turn turn Alex up if they need to. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for letting me know. I'll try to speak loudly. <laughs> um, okay, so th this basically here, I, this is the data that I want to use is the Dinkin diagram and these, these dimensions, these numbers, um, but for the purposes of convert, com comparing this with Yangians and so on, um, we actually want to convert that into some representation theoretic data. So we want to produce two co-weights. Uh, I call one lambda, I call the other one mu. Mm -hmm. and, and these are encoded by the dimensions. So we have dimensions corresponding to um, circled nodes. I've called that VI. 
Now we have dimensions corresponding to box nodes. I'll call those W. So if we come back here, we, we'd have this lambda is like one, the first fundamental plus two times the second plus the third plus eight times the fourth fundamental. And mu is somehow taking the difference between these two, where you think of these nodes as being simple co-roots. Um, so here's some formula. And um, just to make the notation a little easier for myself, I'd, I'm just going to try to remember lambda and mu because they encode basically the information of this diagram. So I'm going to call the corresponding Coulomb branch to this data A lambda mu. And so this is what's sometimes called a truncated shifted Yangian. The reason for that is the following theorem, um, which says that the same mu, it, there's a, a surjective map of algebras from, from a shifted Yangian to this Coulomb branch. Um, this is something we proved, um, <laughs> me and several, a whole bunch of co-authors in the appendix to a paper of PFN. Um, here they are, uh, but we did this in the dominant AD types, ADE types, finite ADE. And uh, I've been able to extend that to all simply lace cats movies. So it's a general statement describing this map of algebras. Um, okay. So, so far this has all been kind of uh, lots of definitions. I, I apologize for that, but I, I hope that the payoff comes now, which is let's do a bunch of examples. So there, let, let's- Can we go back to- Oh, yes, to here. Uh, sorry, um, so you have this subjective map of Algebra. So I assume that's an algebra map. Yes. It's a homomorphism of algebras. Exactly. Does one know something about the kernel? Uh, yes, actually, I, I, there's a couple of things we know. I, I'll come to one at the very end of this talk, I hope. But okay. in general, the kernel is somewhat hard to describe. Um, the Yangian is much, much bigger than its image. Um, the the left hand side is sort of like a polynomial ring and infinitely many generators, roughly, and the right hand side is finite type. Um, so finitely generated. Um, okay. I'll, I'll give several examples in just a second, but um, yeah, essentially what this is saying is that in, in spite of this very abstract definition of the Coulomb branch, mm, it has some generators you can say, right? So you can write down, that's what this theorem says. That you can identify mm -hmm. the images of the Yangian's generator. So um, that's the benefit of it. it I, I view it as a bridge, which goes between having sort of nice generators, which is kind of this Yangian point of view versus very nice, geometric and algebraic properties, which is coming from the Coulomb branch. So it's sort of a mix of the two worlds, one more geometric and one more algebraic. Um, okay. So here's a simple situation. So I, I've taken the, the di Dinkin diagram of SLN and I've added this orientation and these one to just, the nature is one to N. Uh, the orientation actually doesn't matter, but let's just say it's this. I've ignored the framing at the other nodes because it's all going to be zero. So the only interesting framing is at the end. Okay. Um, then <clears throat> the corresponding Coulomb branch is just the enveloping algebra of GLN. Um, and if you like, here's some, you know, these co-weights lambda and mu, what are they? Well, it's like N times the final fundamental. And in fact, the mu in this case is zero. So there's no shift. Um, in this case, you may recall, I mentioned the Coulomb branch always contains this commutative subalgebra, a polynomial ring, but it actually lines up with the gelfin setlin subalgebra of, of, of UGLN. Just to remind you, what is that? Well, it's, it's this thing where you take the, um, this big nested inclusions of GL1 to GL2 to dot, 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 GLN, and you take all of their centers uh, of the enveloping algebras and you put those together. So this is some polynomial ring, um, and that is exactly the equivalent co-modular point in this model. So. The other property is, so the theorem from the previous page said that there's a surjection from the Yangian onto the Coulomb branch. And so in this case, that's basically this very well-known map, which goes from the Drinfeld's Yangian for SLN to the enveloping algebra of SLN. Uh, I said, there's an approximation sign here because this is SLN and I said, it's GLN. There's some you know business about centers here that I'm ignoring. So make, we, you can kind of get either if you want. Um, so this is one of the nicest examples. Uh, and I think the next nicest, probably to most representation theorists would be the following. Let's just mildly generalize that. You keep the same arrangement. So this is still the Dinkin diagram of SLN, but change 
the dimensions and, and still only framing at the final step. So there's some sort of like flag here. Uh, then we have this theorem, which uh, is a combination of, of, of very famous work of Brunet and Khrushchev and, and sort of we've been able to uh, use that with myself with Ben Webster and Oded Jacobi. So we have to make an assumption which is sort of dominant, which says that um, there's a certain inequalities on the, these dimensions. Here they are. So then it says that the, the Coulomb branch is the finite W algebra for GL capital N. So the same number at the end. And um, I'm not gonna say what the finite W algebra is, but it depends on a partition. That partition is coming from these, this data. Uh, and, and the second fact, which is um, you can use this to show because the Coulomb branch has this property that there's this commutative subalgebra, which you might call the gelfin setland subalgebra. It, it proves, for example, that this finite W algebra is free over that. Um, so this is sort of a very non-trivial fact. <laughs> Uh, had, had been conjectured by um, Futorni, Molov, and Ovsienko, for example. And, but from this comparison with the Coulomb branch, you kind of get it for free. Uh, so so re really here, this, this theorem is mostly Brunner and Kleschev, of course. Um, and the map from the Yangian to the W algebra is exactly what Brunner and Kleschev studied. Um, so this, our work is mostly to reinterpret that in terms of Coulomb branches, you could say. Oh, and, and just a final remark, and I wanted to say, which is, if you just drop this condition um, uh, on this sort of dominance, which is right here, you still get very interesting algebras, um, and and you can show that they're what called orthogonal gelfin setland algebras, which are something studied by Mazuchuk. So this isn't actually an, an immediate fact, but rather it's a consequence of this. Um, I'm probably going to go too far. It's a consequence of this theorem here at the bottom that. Uh, that these two things agree. So, which is all to say that we get we get nice W algebras. We get also these slightly more general objects as Coulomb branches. Is this unique to type A because of the your shifted Yangian approach here? Uh, you mean that you get finite W algebras? Uh, yeah, yeah. The fact that you get finite W algebras out of the Coulomb branches is, is that because of this shift this Brundtland question of shifted Yangian approach to W algebras that which is only I, I type A? So. Yeah, I, I believe that there are some, some generalizations of that using sort of twisted Yangians or something. Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert on this, actually, I, I admit. Um, you, I believe that there may be certain circumstances, like particular cases of these Coulomb branches and other types that would agree with finite W algebras, but it's not quite as systematic as what happens in type A. Yeah, some, something very nice happens in type A, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Uh, essentially, what you're asking is, when is a Slotovy slice isomorphic to an affine Grismanian slice? Um, and if that's true, then you get this sort of fact. Okay. Um, in fact, well, I'm, I'm getting slightly ahead of myself, but here's a general theorem of BFN, which sort of explains what I'm saying. In finite ABE type, this, this Coulomb branch, what it quantizes is, is, is what's called a generalized affine Grismanian slice. So, so just to say that again, if you wanted to compare this with a W algebra, what you want to say is that this generalized affine Grassmannian slice is is a slotary slice of like whatever type you want. That's what you would hope. <laughs> um, so in general, these varieties here, I have no time to get into this, but they're very interesting, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll claim, um, from like a geometric representation theory point of view. And just to toss one sentence at you, it's, for example, they're kind of dual in some sense to Nakajima quiver varieties which are also interesting in geometric representation theory. So there's some, whatever properties of Nakajima core variety that you're interested in, there may be some kind of dual version statement on for these generalized affine Grassmannian slices. So this is one of the main motivations for looking at quiver gauge theory is this theorem. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, it may be worth saying that this, this um, BFN construction, remember you could input any quiver because you can always sort of, um, I won't go back. You can always produce these group. You can always produce this representation. It kind of doesn't need to be finite type. It can be basically any graph. Um, and so you can think of their Coulomb branch as some sort of affine Grassmannian slice, even if you're in some kind of strange symmetric Katsmudi type or something. Um, and that's a, kind of an interesting observation because that would be hard to make sense of otherwise. 
Um, so I just wanted to say here before I move on to talking about representations of just some extra facts. Uh, um, one thing is you may be wondering why did I say only ADE? But there actually is an extension of this business to um, um, the other finite types and, and even symmetrizable types um, that I studied with Nakajima, but it hasn't been studied as much. So it's not as much to say. For example, this theorem at the top is still true, but I, I can't say as much about, um, and there's still a link to Yangians, but um, yeah, there, there are some holes. So I'm just, for the purposes of this talk, I would like to stick to simply laced types. Um, Another thing that's probably interesting to people is, is that there are Q versions of all of this um, because <clears throat> the Coulomb branch is defined as homology of something. Instead, you can take K theory. And if you do that, uh, and, and what you can also do is replace the Yangian with a sort of quantum loop algebra or a quantum affine algebra. And this is exactly what was done by Finkelberg and Symboliuk. They studied what are called shifted quantum affine algebras, and uh, it's a long sentence with quantized K-theoretic Coulomb branches. This just means take K-theory instead. So you get some sort of Q version of everything I've just said. Um, for example, if we went back a couple pages, instead of getting the enveloping algebra of GLN, you get UQ GLN um, with some integral structure and stuff. And there's a map. So um, what you can show is that generically, in Q, there's going to be a Q variable floating around here. Um, you have surjectivity here, so sort of you can describe this K-theoretic Coulomb branch in terms of a, an, an affine algebra, a quantum affine algebra. Um, I'll mention that there's actually some other structures that show up, for example, cluster structures, as, as were studied by um, Gus Schrader and Sasha Shapiro. Um, these algebras in K-theory actually have cluster structures. But um, again, this is also not quite as developed a theory. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for today, but I think a good question for the rest of this talk is sort of how do you extend these results to K-theory of what I'm about to say, or any of the stuff in this talk, actually. Um, there are some holes here that kind of need to be filled. <laughs> um, so, very nice. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I could go on too many tangents, uh, I think. Uh, any questions so far? Is, so. I think to summarize, I would say you, you have a very algebraic thing, which is like a yin yin. You have a very uh, abstract geometric definition of a Coulomb branch, and <clears throat> you see that, well, one, there's this surjection that's telling you that something about generators, but you also recover all these very nice algebras. That's how I would think of this so far. Okay. So um, the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk about some representation theory. Um, there's a lot that one can say, and I probably am not saying all of it, that's for sure. Um, but let's, let's go on. So if we think of this surjection <clears throat> of from the Yangian to the, um, well, it's not really necessary to think of this surjection, but this is how I frame things. So there's some map which you can think of taking Yang modules for this Coulomb branch to modules for the Yangian, for example. Um, in fact, that's not really my focus in the rest of this talk, I realize, but I've, I've set up this section this way. Uh, one of the reasons is because people may know more about the representations of the Yangians, for example. So you could ask, what, what do you get when you do this, um, for example? And <clears throat> one of the nice things about Coulomb branches is that there have been some pretty powerful techniques developed already. Um, I can think of two, which I'll discuss, for studying their modules. So this Coulomb branch has some very abstract definition, but you can still get at its modules. And, and the reason for that um, comes from the following sort of analogy, which is a kind of finite dimensional in, in a sense, which I'll explain. So um, suppose we took a M, a smooth variety, and two, some map which is proper. So, you know, a sort of, um, yeah, a proper map of varieties. Then <clears throat> if you open the book by Chris and Ginsburg, you'll see that there's, there's a construction of an algebra called a convolution algebra. Um, it's the homology, Borel-Mohr homology of, of this um, fiber product, I, I should remind. I mean, the fiber product is the usual thing. It's, it's these pairs which have the same image in, in N. Um, it can also be described as an X algebra. These algebras have very nice uh, descriptions of their module theory, um, which are described by Ginsburg and, and in this book. And <clears throat> what the case is that actually that this, this Coulomb branch is sort of an analogously defined thing, but the unfortunate part, as we'll see, is that you need to take infinite dimensional sort of spaces here. 
And so it's very difficult to make sense of it or whether things are well-defined is hard. But this is the kind of motivation is, is what can you use, what properties that are say in the Chris Ginsburg book can you try to use to study Coulomb branches? Um, so, uh, well, what I just said, let me actually explain what I meant. So let's look at, um, I've just, just introduced a little bit of notation, the uh, Laurent series K and the uh, power series, formal power series O. And you can look at the loop group, which is sort of, um, yeah, well, I guess I mentioned these before already, but the points of G, which have, you know, uh, Laurent series entries, if, if G is GLN, then this is really matrices with Laurent series entries with a non-zero determinant. And same thing for power series. And similarly, you can form these vector spaces on which these two groups will act, which is by sort of just tensoring with Laurent series or tensoring your representation with power series. And um, this gets to <laughs> what Yevgeny asked earlier, which is, um, you can then form these two spaces, which I'm going to suggestively call M and N. And one of them is you take the, the product of the loop group with this power series version of the representation. And this space here, this product, has an action of, of the power series points of G. Um, it acts on the, this representation. It also acts on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, on this. And so you can form the quotient. So, um, this is a vector bundle which lives over the Afrangismanian. It's an induced vector bundle. On the other hand, you have this, this vector space here, infinite dimensional. Just take your, your representation and tensor it with Laurent series. There's a map from M to N, which is just acting. So you take your, you take your element of the loop group, you just act on the vector here. Uh, because you started with a Laurent series and a power series, well, you might end up with a, a Laurent series. So it goes here. So the claim is that, and this should be sort of, this equal sign is kind of needs care in being interpreted, but A is equal to something which looks like the previous page, right? Uh, there's only two problems. One is that everything in sight was infinite dimensional. And the second problem, of course, is uh, there's an equivariance here, which, okay, well, it is, it is what it is. So again, you, you open Chris and Ginsburg, you say, what, what things that were studied there can we try to apply here? Well, one version, um, one thing you can do is what's done by Ben Webster and also in unpublished work of um, Nakajima. You can actually replace all of these infinite dimensional spaces with some associated finite dimensional spaces in a very concrete way, but which I, I don't want to explain for lack of time. Um, so there are finite dimensional sort of, I've called it G fine, M fine, N fine, so that you can look at this convolution algebra here. So it's a finite dimensional, it's, it's not a finite dimensional algebra, but it's the homology of a finite dimensional space is what I mean. It's a finite replacement of this infinite thing. And this algebra they show, it, it actually describes what's called gelfin settlement modules for the algebra A. So you have your Coulomb branch, <clears throat> it's some complicated ring, you replace it with a slightly simpler ring and that allows you to capture this interesting category of modules. So this is one perspective. Uh, and I thought it's maybe it seems very abstract. Let me just say, so let's just say what, what for GLN do I mean by these things? So there's recall, we have the enveloping algebra of GLN. We have this big commutative algebra called the gelfin settlement algebra. So all the centers of GL1, GL2, GL dot, 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 or the enveloping algebra is zero. So if you look at a module for UGLN, you can call it gelfin setland if it breaks into a direct sum of generalized eigenspaces for this subalgebra. So I have a direct sum uh, where each n tau is a, is a common eigenspace for gamma, generalized eigenspace. So this includes all finite dimensional modules for GLN because famously they have gelfin setland patterns, right? Um, gelfin settlement patterns exactly index this, this maximal ideals and they give a basis. So, so that includes all of, you know, probably your favorite representations, but this category of gelfin settlement modules also includes all the highest weight modules like Verma modules, um, category O, et cetera. And so this is what I mean by the category of gelfin settlement modules from the previous page. So we're saying that that category is actually captured by some other algebra. And um, 
the theorem of Webster and sort of also, you could say, can Kanitzer, Tingley, Webster, myself, and Oded Jacobi says, this is a, a first rough version of it anyway. We can describe this category of gelfin settling modules for UGLN, and we can even enumerate the simple objects. And um, this was actually sort of a, a very active area of research, and I think still is. And it's a difficult problem, and <clears throat> this Coulomb Gantz perspective sort of gives a very different perspective, a, a different point of view on it, um, which I think is very powerful. Uh, as I said, this is still just the first version, but um, I'll say it slightly more precisely on the next slide. But I think that this is an interesting result. So unexpected. You think that, you know, the algebra G, UGLN, this enveloping algebra, you know everything about it. <laughs> but thought of as a Coulomb branch, actually, you can say something new. Um, so I, I find that remarkable. Um, OK. And as I said, here's a slightly more precise statement, which, again, is mostly due to Ben Webster, but also some, some of the rest of us in this list. Um, so here we can consider any of the quivers that we started with. So it could have been type A4 or actually anything. Um, I put an asterisk because in our paper, we only considered uh, bipartite simply laced type, but I, I'm pretty sure this just applies across the board. Um, so first of all, this finite type thing, which captures the gelfin settling modules is actually a KLR algebra. <laughs> Um, or KLRW, so that's named after Kovanov, Lauda, Rukier, and Webster. Um, and second, the simple objects are parameterized by some crystal. So there's some combinatorial gadget which encodes the simple objects. This is the theorem. Um, so this Kovanov, Lauda, Rukier, Webster algebra um, uh, may be familiar to some of you that's, that's related to say categorification. Um, they're also called quiver Hecke algebras. So this is appearing in this Coulomb branch theory um, by taking this finite dimensional version and so on. So um, there's a big story here about categorification, which I, I won't get into today, but um, again, remarkable that it just sort of pops out of this Coulomb branch picture. Um, what did I say next? Oh, I see. Well, okay, so here back to Yangians. Um, just one observation, which is we have a KLR algebra, which is, which is really isomorphic to, sorry, it encodes this category of modules. So there's a functor from, you take a module for the KLR algebra, you actually get a module for the Coulomb branch. And then because of the map from the Yangian, you actually get a module over the Yangian. So there's a functor here from the KLR algebra modules to modules for the Yangian, or restricted Yangian. Um, and some similar things have been studied for quantum affine algebra. So I just wanted to ask a question, which I don't know the answer to. Is this related to the work of Kang, Kashiwara, Kim, and O? Oh? who have studied KLR algebras or quiver Hecke algebras and quantum affine algebras. There's some functors there. I don't know if this is the same. Uh, maybe there's an easy answer, I'm not sure. But again, this is all coming from the Coulomb branch theory with, with kind of uh, just some nice geometric tools, I would say. Um, and so this is what's going on in this case of GLN. There's some particular KLR algebra actually, which is encoding this category of gelfin settling modules, again, which includes all the fine dimensionals and all this. Um, so, and, the, and this enumeration of simples is by some crystals. Okay, so uh, that's one, I would say, perspective on representation theory of Coulomb branches. Um, I just wanted to give one more before I wrap up, um, which is, so let's just recall this finite dimensional analogy that I mentioned. Again, we look at this Chris and Ginsburg book. There's some smooth variety. We have a proper map. We get this algebra. Um, there's a general recipe, which is sort of the Springer theory. You could say you just take the fibers of this map and this algebra will act on them. Um, this is how you build the Springer representations, for example, and, and some specific choices. Right? Um, and what you can ask is, can we apply this in our infinite dimensional situation? So. Um, I'll just say the answer. I mean, uh, yes. And we want to start with something in the, the target of this map, which if you recall from two slides ago, it's some vector with Laurent series entries. And what you get are what are called generalized affine Springer fibers. So they're points in the affine Grassmannian. Here it is. Uh, such that you have this condition that when you take your vector, it's actually sort of in the image of G up to 
so if our representation v here was not just some random representation, or sorry, sorry, I should say, if we replace the, this right-hand thing, v of o, by the Iwahori, or uh, the Lie algebra tensor with g of o, this would actually be an affine Springer fiber. Um, but here we have a little bit more general version involving some representation. So th this is something that was studied by uh, Gorski, Kotwitz, McPherson, and others. Um, uh, yeah, in general, it's kind of hard to say stuff about them, but but what we're able to show is that actually this analogy with the finite dimensional situation does play out. And this quantum Coulomb branch acts on the equivariant homology of these generalized affine Springer fibers. Um, there's maybe some technical issues about what type of C you might want to choose, but we can kind of, I think, gloss over for now. Um, I, I just want to say that this actually recovers something that is maybe better known, which is um, certain Certain of the, some of these fibers are related to spaces of, of what are called quasi maps. Um, this is coming from interpreting this space as a module at bundles. Uh, and in particular, you'll recall that <clears throat> one of the Coulomb branches was the finite W algebra. And if you run through this story in that case and choose the appropriate choice of C, what you get actually is a Lamont space. Um, it's a moduli space of, of sheaves with certain sort of flag conditions on them. So that's what this theorem is saying, is that actually you're, you have an action of the W algebra on the Lamont space. Um, and here's another question. So such a thing has actually been studied before by several people. Uh, I'll just mention one paper, which I think is one of the first, is Barman, Fagan, Finkelberg, Ribnikov. There's also a paper of Nakajima, um, who studied finite W algebras of GLN acting on such things. So we don't know whether it agrees or not because it's a very different looking construction, <laughs> but that may be the case. Um, so here's the second way in which this Coulomb branch story is giving kind of modules, uh, interesting modules for algebras. Uh, okay. So um, I have one more slide, which is just a little different direction. And this goes back to a question that Erhard asked <laughs> near the beginning, which is, um, how do you describe the ideal of this map? <laughs> um, so again, there's some shifted Yangian. It's an explicitly presented thing. There's this kind of complicated definition of a Coulomb branch algebra. Here it is. Well, here's <clears throat> one answer use, using highest weight theory. So uh, it's the theorem. Oh, yes. Um, to myself and also we proved the version of this in type A for W algebras, but very different proofs. Um, it says the following. So basically, uh, okay, I, I could have rephrased this, but if your algebra has non-trivial highest weight modules, for example, if A was UGLN, of course you have highest weight modules. So then the theorem is that there's at least one simple, I'm uh, sorry, at least one faithful highest weight module. So for GLN, that's pretty clear. You just take a Verma module, for example, that will be faithful. Um, and it has to have some simple factor in the composition series. So there you go. Um, but what this tells you, if you think about it, is that this, you can describe the kernel of this map. It's actually the annihilator of that module, right? You just take this faithful module, take its annihilator. Now you have a description which, which doesn't really mention the Coulomb branch anymore. You just had some simple module for the Yangian and you took the annihilator. Um, a little differently, you can intersect, intersect sort of all the annihilators of of simple highest weight modules of the Coulomb branch. And the upshot of this actually, um, which uh, I won't sort of throw at you because it's be too much information probably, but you can, you can enumerate that in sort of combinatorial terms. The set of simple modules for this Coulomb branch algebra has a description as some crystal. And you can phrase that in terms of the Yangian without using the Coulomb branch anymore. So this is the description of this Coulomb branch completely in terms of the representation theory of a Yangian. Um, just say, take some simple module, some particular one, take its annihilator, that is the kernel. Uh, so this theorem, um, again, in general, uses the theory that I've just talked about, but, um, and it sort of answers this question in an indirect way, but I think it's a nice answer for, <laughs> for now. Um, so that's actually all I had to say, so thank you for listening. I'll slip my... I'll flip my favorite end of slide quote. This is not, this is a joke, of course. Please ask questions. Uh. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your talk. 
Uh, may I ask if there are questions? Uh, I have a simple question. Sure, please go ahead. Alex, you had these arrows on, on, on your quivers, but you never made any use of them, or maybe I yeah. missed that. No, you're right. So, you're right. So maybe I should have just uh, omitted this data. I, I didn't want to pull the rug too far, you know, over everyone's eyes. Um, technically, it's used in the definition, but actually it's, it's, it, it turns out that it does not depend up to isomorphism on the choice. So um, it, it's, it's essential in the definition but of the Coulomb branch, but it, in the end does not matter. So you could say you can kind of forget it. So. Okay, are there more questions? Uh, maybe it is worth saying, sorry, uh, just to elaborate. In fact, when you talk about, for example, here, I was talking about some sort of Springer theory. Um, the arrows are going to change what this V is, right? Um, when I have an arrow from a node with a one to a node with a two, I'm gonna take com from C to D two. If I flip the arrow, I'm going to get the map the other way. And so it actually has a very big impact in this Springer theory on, on what types of fibers you get. And in particular, you, you might wanna allow yourself to start changing all the arrows around and see what you can achieve. Um, and you'll get very different things. So that's one instance here actually where hidden in this definition, the arrows actually did matter. <laughs> But uh, in general, in, in the sense, the algebra does not depend on the choice. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. More question? I, I had one question. Uh, I, I've seen this definition of this uh, shifted, truncated, shifted Yangian, and it looks absolutely horrendous. Uh, so did did this object, I, I guess you, one way of define, defining it would be what you were describing at the ver very end with your description of what a lambda mu is um, combinatorially. Uh, but did this, is this object just designed for this express purpose to, uh, to give you a description of a mu lambda or, or did this have some life of its own and a, a reason for describing it in such complicated terms? Yeah. Um... I can, I can go a little of the history. This is inspired by Brunin Kleshev's theorem, which you may recall, I said earlier, was a map from a Yangian to a W algebra. Um, and in their theorem, they give a very precise description of the kernel. Um, it's, it's better than this description here. They say it's generated by some explicit finite list of elements, actually. Um, and so initially, this truncated shift of Yangian, we also have a finite set of elements that we think describe the kernel. I, I didn't list them here. Um, it's also a little technical looking, but it, at least it's just an explicit list. But it turned out that um, around the same time as when this Coulomb branch theory was kind of invented. And the advantage of the Coulomb branch story is you just have the map, you don't kind of need to describe the kernel. <laughs> or rather, their construction just produces this algebra. Um, so if you didn't care about Yangians, you could, you could just throw away the Yangians altogether and just say, I want to study Coulomb branches. Um, we had other reasons for studying Yangians in this instance, which uh, you could say are kind of inspired by Brendan Kleshev or are inspired by wanting to study the Afrangismanian, which is also related to Yangians. So, yeah, it's a roundabout tale. <laughs> there are, there, as I said, there, so there is actually a, an, another conjectural version of this theorem, which is not about annihilators. It's just here is the kernel. Here's some two-sided ideal uh, with some explicit generators but I don't know which one is nicer. <laughs> Maybe I chose the wrong one today. Okay, now there are more questions. Give a comment maybe to the same question. I don't remember the details well, but somehow some very similar, we call them shifted truncated or shifted somehow Yangans appeared in, in works of uh, Eric Ragusi in, in, in 90s. That was related to integrable systems. Mm -hmm. Right. It may, maybe Alex could say more about that. So I, I want to say I don't, I don't want to misspeak. I believe that that is part of Brendan Kleshev's definition. Now I hope that's true, but it, I believe it would be related. Um, so certainly these algebras here are very closely related to integrable systems um, because of this Gelfand-Zetland subalgebra, actually. So again, that's. 
there's too many things to talk about. Uh, I probably already included too many, but <laughs> uh, for example, you you know the enveloping algebra of GLN has this integrable system, this Gelfin Settlements of algebra. Well, all, all of these do, and, and certainly all of the truncated shifted Yangians have this nice integral system. I I think that I, I again I'm not. I hesitate to say this assuredly, but I think that that definition of Ragusi would be very much related to, to this one um, because of Brandon Koshka's work. But I, I hope that's the case. I don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, is there another question? If it's not the case, then before we all leave the meeting, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for their very fascinating talks. Uh, I know that it is much more complicated to prepare a um, Zoom talk than to give a talk in present and presence. We would all like to have been at the CRM, but uh, that's how it is. Um, I would like to thank Virginia Leduc uh, for her technical help. We are very grateful that the CRM has uh, allowed us to host or has hosted this conference. I think we all live uh, in isolation right now. So it was good to meet some fellow mathematicians and to hear uh, what other people are doing. <laughs>